Hello, everyone. I am Luz Rodriguez, Social Protection Specialist at the World Bank, and I have the honor to coordinate the Washington, D.C. desk of ISPA, the Interagency Social Protection Assessment Initiative. I would like to welcome you to the sixth webinar of our webinar series on the ISPA tools. This is the first webinar on the Public Works tool that has been developed by a group of experts from different development partners, including, including DFAT, the European Commission, the Government of Finland, GIZ, ILO, ODI, OECD, WFP, and the World Bank. For us, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and to learn about your interest in the relevance of public works programs on social protection. Today, we want to provide an overview of the public works tool that is currently available in our site, www.ispatools.org. We would like you to understand how this tool works and how it could be useful for your work on social protection issues. Um, before starting, we want to thank our colleagues from socialprotection.org who have worked with us hand on hand in the organization of this webinar series and who also have helped us to reach a large audience. Our panelists today is Mito Sukamoto. Mito is Senior Specialist Employment Intensive investment at ILO. Uh, Ms. Sukamoto joined the ILO in 1994, where she has worked in various capacities. Mito has worked on sustainable infrastructure development since about 2005, linking humanitarian livelihoods, employment policy, and natural and physical infrastructure development. Mito has worked both in Bangkok and in Geneva on community-driven efforts to use employment-intensive investments through public works programs over the last 11 years. Mito led the ILO team in strengthening the synergies between public employment programs, social protection floor, and climate change adaptation to address the different multiple objectives of public work programs and highlighting their economic, social, and environmental impact in addressing the need for decent work and social justice. In her most recent posting, Mito has contributed to the ILO's response to the global economic and financial crisis, where she co-authored a policy paper named Towards the Right to Work, Innovations in Public Employment Programs, a guidebook for designing innovative public employment programs. Also, she continues working on adaptation to climate change issues, and she co-authored a policy paper named towards an ILO approach to climate change adaptation. And also she works on youth employment, where she co-authored a report named Boosting Youth Employment Through Public Employment Programs. Mito holds an MBA and honor certificate in international business diplomacy from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Uh, so today, Mito is gonna, going to introduce us in a, a, about the ISPA initiative and also on the contribution of public work programs in social protection. After that in initial presentation, we will do a break to allow your questions and then she will continue with the second part of the presentation that will be focused on the, of the, on the ISPA public works programs itself. Uh, we invite the people to, uh, to post your questions. Uh, and um, to tweet um, uh, any reactions to this webinar uh, in our in our Twitter account. Mito, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Luz. Um, and it, also, I'd like to take a take the moment just to thank the colleagues from IPC, the World Bank, and the ILO um, for actually allowing us to make this webinar possible. Um, so next, if you could maybe go to the first slides. One more slide, please. So basically, this webinar, as Luce has just mentioned, we will be introducing the interagency social protection assessment, but specifically focusing on the public works program tool. Um, I should also first start by mentioning that I'm doing this presentation on behalf of the public works um, working group which is currently comprised of the different colleagues, as has already been mentioned earlier. So today's agenda, I'd like to focus on giving you just some background and history of the ISPA for those of you who are not familiar with this ISPA. 
Um, second, to talk about how public works have been used under a social protection framework. And that, that's when I'd like to do a first break, um, just to allow any questions, if there's anything that is not clear, any concepts um, that require some clarification. Um, and then the second part of the presentation will be focusing on what is in the public works tool, looking at the various criteria, including the assessment criteria, questionnaires, um, which is in a simple XLS format for uh, country level use, the assessment matrix, the country report, which eventually influences policy dialogue, and then looking at the implementation guidelines. And then hopefully we'll still have some time for some interaction and discussion. Next, please. Okay, so basically, why, what is it about the ISFA tools and what kind of issues are we addressing that governments are having to face um, when talking about social protection systems? Oftentimes, consistent guidance is sought from development partners to provide coherent and consistent advice. Um, if we go to the next slide, sorry. Yes, there we go. So we, don't, we all know that this is not always the case, that agencies and institutions you know, oftentimes have different mandates and different perspectives and can oftentimes also be pulled by member states in different in taking different directions. What the ESPA tool tries to do is that it tries to address some of these challenges and these challenges that the governments would be faced in, re in regards to um, developing or to putting together a coherent social protection system by bringing different development partners together to be able to provide joint guidance on designing social protection systems, programs and delivery mechanisms um, with this hope of having a larger impact and a more coherent impact. Consistent guidance is also sought from development partners, especially to be able to assess or analyze these national systems, to be able to design, reform national social protection systems or programs, to be able to strengthen the administration and delivery of some of these systems. Um, and I won't go into detail, but there are certain tools that have also been developed around the identification systems and the payment systems and also in terms of improving governance and administration. These are other tools that have been developed also under the ESPA framework, um, but they're actually separate tools. And then also to look at um, how, how, how the, these social protection program systems can be evaluated for their impact and to be monitored. So next, please. So what exactly are the ESPA tools? Basically, there are a set of practical tools that analyze the performance of social protection systems, their programs, and their delivery mechanisms. The main ob overall objective is to help countries be able to improve these systems by providing a social protection framework and a series of practical tools to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the overall system of policy schemes, programs, administrative and implementation structures which are in place, offering policy options for further action. Um, something that I think is, is important to highlight here is that these tools are not just one, not, they're not owned by just one agency. These are tools that have been developed um, in joint collaboration and coordination with different um, uh, development partners, and therefore they reflect a somewhat consensual view. So basically this means that after a somewhat painful process sometimes, these tools have been developed in consensus by different partners and that the tools actually include also possibly the identity of some of the partners that have been involved. And I just wanted to give one example, which I think is, is you know, is interesting. I mean, each agency came with different, um, I would say, mandates and backgrounds. So obviously in the discussions, you know, we, we were able to not only come to a consensus, but also we were able to contribute different things. So just as one example, WFP came with the KCAL person per day energy requirement calculations, which can be useful, especially if you're looking at food insecurity or looking at food as a means of in-kind payment. So just to say that different agencies had inputs to the tools, um, but it is, I think that's the maybe the one of the positive highlights of this tool is that it, it was done in consensus and it was done by multiple partners. Next. What, so what does um, an ESPA tool, what is included in an ESPA tool? Basically, there's five elements um, which are included in all ESPA tools. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to be focusing a lot on public works, but it really is a general, um, I would say, standard format that the, each of the ESPA tools includes a what matters guide. And in the case of the public works tool, it actually talks about conceptual matters around public works in a social protection framework and how these public works are used as a means to achieve different types of objectives and outcomes. It also provides guidance on how to fill out the various documents, which are also mentioned in this slide, 
um, such as the questionnaire, which as I mentioned earlier, um, is can be accessible in an, ex, in an Excel format, which makes it very easy um, and in a very simplified format to allow whoever is actually doing the data input to be able to use these forms um, in a simple way. Then there's the assessment matrix, which is based on a four point scale, which allows basically to give um, users a visual image of the impacts and definite deficits, um, but might by no means is it meant as a mechanism for comparison. Um, and it should be mentioned that all these tools were basically developed to be contextualized and used by the country for their own for their own purposes. Then we have the country report, which basically presents the findings from the data, from the field assessments, and all the information that has been collected, highlighting where the strengths are and where the weaknesses may be. And then the implementation guideline is basically the how-to and the guide that um, you know informs the entire process. Next. So by now you're probably wondering, so why, why should we use the ESPAD tool? So in the field of public works, there's basically a myriad of ways in which public works have been used for different objectives and perspectives. Within the social protection framework, there are many synergies that can be made to ensure that these public works programs are sustainable and made in long term or developed in a long term approach. Um, and even sometimes used as a short-term measure, but with a sustainable um, approach embedded into the way that they're being designed. These can also, and, and if, and if that, the design is done in such a way that we're looking at it from a long-term perspective, they can better integrate with existing national systems where the systems actually exist. But at the same time, if the national social protection systems don't exist, then these public works programs have the opportunity to extend social protection, which they've been doing for many years now, um, in countries and for people who have never been fortunate to have any sort of social protection coverage. Um, so it really is about building cohesive social protection systems. I think our social protection colleagues oftentimes will say that three out of four persons do not have any sort of social protection coverage. Um, I think the second point is that the government can count on consistent and reliable evidence um, on improving the effectiveness of their systems. The ISPA serves um, not just as not just as a platform to bring the different agencies together with different mandates, but it also allows for a much better coordinated and, um, and allows for integrated advice from the different agencies, um, in addition to creating this platform and being able to just exchange information between the different agencies. And of course, all of this is being done um, to be able to provide better goods and services to the beneficiaries of these programs. So. Just on the historical part of the ESPA, the tool was developed as part of a coalition of over 20 plus international development partners as part of the SPACB, the Social Protection and Interagency Cooperation Board, um, composed of different representatives, as Luce has already mentioned, international organizations, bilateral institutions, to be able to enhance the global coordination and advocacy around these the social protection issues. It was set up in 2012 under the co-chair of ILO and World Bank. And as you, as many of you probably know, the establishment of the board was in response to requests from the G20 working group. Um, and one of the main initiatives that emerged from all this was the development of these but tools. Next. So basically, this is a diagram that shows you um, the different ESPA tools that have been, that where there has been discussion of um, developing some some of these 20 tools that you see in the screen. But each of these tools, um, and I think this is how each of the tools is set up, is that each tool will have a different agency um, that will be taking the lead along with the different development partners and members of each working group. They may be actively participating or passively participating, that, but, but that are very much, um, I would say, um, active contributors or have been involved um, in, each of these different types of either systems programs or delivery tools. The public works assessment tool was one of the first programs that was program tools that was actually developed um, with again both UN agencies and bilateral partners. It was developed as an assessment tool that can be used by the countries within their own con country context and especially to be able to evaluate their own public works programs um, and to ensure that they've incorporated the key relevant components necessary to achieve the intended objectives of the program in question. And again, the advantage of the tool is that it's not just one agency's tool, but that it's been validated and approved by all the experts, both from technical agencies and financing institutions. In the case of the public works tool, I would say there was a mix. Um, I mean, there were mostly social protection colleagues, but also myself being more of an employment expert. Um, again, you know, with different views, but coming together under this social protection framework. Next. 
So the tools that are available today, um, and Luz can correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, um, there's a diagnostics tool called CODI. Um, there's the public works tool, um, which is the one that we are discussing today. There is the payments tool, and there is also the um, identification tool. So again, each of these tools have been led by different agencies. They may have a different configuration of agencies involved. Um, and the tools now are, are, uh, are made available um, thanks to the collaboration of uh, the various agencies. They're available in English, French, and Spanish, and currently they're being translated into Arabic. Next. So who are the users of these ESPA tools? Basically, it's open to anybody. It's open source code, um, in a sense. The tools are available on the website, the link that you see there. Um, the target group, for the, I would say, for the public works tool, is, I would say, is mainly social protection or public works experts. Um, everywhere, anything from government institutions, international development agencies, to academic or research institutions. Um, usually, there is a, in the case of the few that I've been following, there's been about a one or two week field assessment. Um, and usually made up of two to four experts um, with an open invitation to those agencies who are members of the public works working group. Um, and there's, it's usually led by an not only an international consultant, but also a national consultant. So it's very important to have that national presence there and to have um, that balance, I would say, the, the joint collaboration between the international group, I would say the global group in between the agencies, but also at the local level, the different agencies that are on the ground. And I would say that the local level is more important. So in many cases, the people who have participated in the field assessments have been the ones who are from the local offices. Next. So when should the ISPA tool be used? Um, basically, the tool can be used by both government and international agencies. Um, both from at the time of the design, maybe they want to use the checklist as a way to design their programs. Um, they can be used throughout the implementation to, to uh, verify or to monitor, but they can also be used all the way through evaluations or even in some cases consultants who are being hired to do sector reviews would probably benefit from using the tool. The tool, basically it can be initiated um, either by the government who decides to completely do an assessment on its own, or it could also be a government who has been, uh, or a government member who has been contacted by one of the agencies involved in the ESPA initiative, and, we, and, um, and they will request the agency for support. Or it could also be a development partner who may propose the use of the ESPA tool um, to support our government in impl implementing our particular process, for example, the scaling up of a large public works program. Um, I should also add that they have been used, especially the public works tool has been used in desk reviews. Um, it was reviewed a couple of years ago to assess the impact of several youth programs um, in public works in the past. Next. Okay, so here I wanted to talk a bit about the conceptual. So what exactly do we mean when we talk about public works as part of social protection? Next. We're basically talking about public works um, used as a source of income or transfer, and the transfer could be food or in-kind or cash or wage payment, um, which is generating employment, income security, and oftentimes is also creating a public good, which could be an asset or a service. It's also very much about community-based public or private finance programs that support the poor and the food insecure. And some institutions have oftentimes coined this as social safety nets, but it's, we're basically talking about public works which, are, which have the main objective to, in, to provide income security or extend social protection to the most vulnerable. Next. So in this coming diagram, what I wanted to show was some of the multiple objectives that exist in public works. I think many of us who have been involved with public works over the years, um, there's different types of objecti objectives that exist. Um, oftentimes there are multiple objectives, and with that, of course, you have the trade-offs. So as I had mentioned earlier, public works are a great vehicle for having significant economic, social, and environmental impact or benefit if they're designed well. But at the same time, there are multiple objectives that we need to be aware of. There's also trade-offs in how they're being designed. So I think in general, um, and I wish this were a little more interactive because I feel like I'm talking to myself, but in general, I think we can agree that there are three key objectives in implementing public works. I mean, on one side, if we're talking about social protection, it can certainly be about ensuring income security for the active working age. 
Um, if we're talking about um, the employment, it can be about employment generation with the multipliers that it may have on the local economy and also as an investment in human capital when we talk about capacity building or employability. It can also be about creating the very much needed public goods, you know, and these are public goods which are um, either assets or services. And basically, as we all know, there's different types of sources of financing for these objectives, which oftentimes also means that this public works typology has certain trade-offs. So if we look at the programs, and I just wanted to highlight, if we look at the two bubbles of employment social protection, if we look at where these programs are overlapping, um, in employment and social protection, the focus should basically not comprise the quality of the built infrastructure, the asset or the service. If we look at the overlap between social protection and public goods or infrastructure assets and services, the focus then is how to ensure that income security through sectoral or multi-sectoral investments um, are being done, but without compromising the labor practices or the conditions of work. And I think the last overlap, which is the uh, overlap of employment and public goods, there is a you know there is there is a potential that what could be compromised is the investment in human capital, where the focus may be more on just creation of jobs and the kilometers of infrastructure to be created without actually taking into consideration um, conditions of work or um, capacity building of the actual workers. Okay, next. So I, I think with this, you know, we, I, it, for those of you who are have worked with public works, I think you get a sense that there's a wide spectrum of public work programs. And it's unfortunate that we talk about public works as if it were one thing, because there's many different angles to public works, many different objectives and therefore trade-offs. And when we look at the wide spectrum of public works, we're really talking about everything from short-term emergency programs, which could be post-disaster or post-conflict and fragile contexts. But at the same time, we may be talking about those public employment programs or universal employment guarantee schemes like the ones in India, you know, where you may also, or South Africa, where you're addressing market failures. Um, you may also be faced with different or sometimes multiply, multiple objectives and then having to determine what the trade-offs are. And as I had mentioned earlier, you know, there's, a, there's an issue with the source of financing, which also means that different line ministries, different, uh, you know, public or private sector, social funds, infrastructure funds, everyone ha comes from their different perspective and their different, I would say, tug and pull of their objectives. Um, as being the most important. So I think all of this is very important to keep in mind, especially when you're designing these programs. So I, I still reckon that the tool, although it's a good assessment tool, it also serves as a good checklist um, for when one is designing these programs. Next. Yeah, so I just, I, I guess I wanted to just take the time to quickly highlight um, some of the the acknowledged benefits, um, if you'd like, of uh, of public works. Um, I think, you know, we know that public works can be used as a great means to provide immediate income or wages, and that's both cash or in kind, um, in, turn for in return of for labor, and that that could then have direct and indirect local economic multipliers into the economy and also provide livelihoods for the most vulnerable. Um, at the same time, by generating meaningful employment or productive employment and by enhancing skills, we're also talking about the dignity of work and um, the human investment um, side of public works. At the same time, and I haven't mentioned this, and I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the multiple objectives, there is another bubble that I think you could even add to this, which is the environmental aspect. Um, many of these, I would say, employment intensive or labor-based programs, um, oftentimes you're talking about recruiting um, you know, quite a lot of um, vulnerable workers. It also is a great mechanism for sensitizing, not just capacity building, but also sensitizing workers on the importance of um, environmental protection or environmental degradation. So it also serves as, uh, I think, as a means to um, provide water and soil conservation, but at the same time, train the workers on what this means in terms of impacts, um, especially now when we're addressing climate change adaptation and other environmental risks. Um, and then, of course, you know, at the same time, of course, because we're doing public works, we're basically creating, maintaining, rehabilitating assets and are providing services for the communities. And these are all public goods and public goods oftentimes need to be maintained. So the maintenance parts is where you can actually have a great opportunity to create not only jobs, but also ensure income predictable and stable income security for the actual workers. And if properly designed, this could also contribute to strengthening 
um, those national social protection systems where they exist and then also to support the building of them where they don't exist. But very much I think that the focus here still should and needs to be about providing wages and income security um, to the people that you know the most needed um, and I think public works is a is a is a good vehicle to do that. So next and I will pause here. I don't know how the Q&A works, but um, I will turn over to Luz. But I think this would be a good moment to stop just to see if anybody has any remarks or comments or questions. Hi, uh, hi Mito. So far, we don't have questions on this particular part of the presentation. So if um, you think it's OK, I mean, this and uh, the audience has the option to ask their questions now or we can wait until the end of your presentation. So let's give them 20 seconds. And if, if we don't receive anything, we'll continue. Should I continue, Luz, then? Uh, yes, let's continue. Okay, so I hope what I've said so far was clear and everybody agrees and that's why there's no questions, but I do also welcome any remarks. Um, I think it's always more interesting when the discussions are interactive. So let, let me then continue and then, I'll, and then we can open it up for questions um, afterward. Okay, so let me then move on. Um, okay, so more in detail about the public works tool. So next. So just an overview of where the public works tool has been used so far. There were two pilots, one in El Salvador and the other one in Liberia. Um, these pilots were, um, were carried out, led by the World Bank. Um, they were joined by the ILO and WFP. Um, then there was, a, then there were, there was a, a request specifically from the government of Senegal. Again, this was another um, public works tool assessment, which was led by the World Bank, and it was joined by the ILO, WFP, the Delegación de Protección Social, which is the social protection program, the AGTIP, and the what's called the Programme Nacional de Développement Local, which is a local development entity. Um, so just to highlight here that in many cases, um, you know, the, the initiative comes from the from the local, I would say the national level, it's not HQ that, um, or the global level that initiates it, it's usually the country that finds an uh, interest to do this and then will either request one of the agencies um, and then the other partners um, will be invited at the global and local level to participate in the field mission. So the fourth um, assessment, application of the assessment was in Tanzania, this was a request by um, TASAF, uh, which is the social fund in Tanzania. Um, this was a request that the ILO had received, so we led the process, joined by the EU Social Protection Systems Group, mainly um, represented by Finland and OECD. Um, the country report for this um, is available. You can see it online on the ISPA um, Public Works website. Um, and there, I, I have to, I, I would just like to highlight that, you know, the government um, has been very much involved in the whole process. And as you will notice in the webinar, so this is a little plug for the next webinar, the webinar that will be held on the 21st of September um, will be very much focused on the Tanzanian case with um, participation from TASAF and our colleagues from Finland who were um, part of this. And then finally, in terms of what other countries have shown interest, um, we have heard from Colombia as part of the peace process. Um, there's also intentions to carry out an assessment in Malawi, Mozambique, and Niger. And most recently, um, we've had some exchanges with um, colleagues in Egypt. So there, there is some interest to do this. Um, and I should also maybe highlight that the difference between Tanzania and Senegal was that Tanzania was an assessment of one program, whereas in Senegal, they basically did an inventory, not only of social protection related public works program, but also national infrastructure programs. Um, and then they did uh, an assessment, for a more thorough assessment of just a few of those programs. Okay, so next. So what, what, is it, what, what is included in the public works tool? It's very, basically a coherent framework, you know, to provide the systematic analysis um, of public works I would say designed as part of social protection systems. There were eight um, criteria or eight steps that were to be taken. Um, 
And, uh, and as I, again, the data collection of this is done through a simple Excel file. Um, so the first part is the assessment of the eligibility and targeting. Second is nature of benefits, timing, and duration. Third is the identification of asset creation and services required. Fourth is the capacity of institutions, coordination, and financing. Next. The fifth is about monitoring and evaluation. Six, on coherence and interaction across the different programs. And this is, I think, one of the interesting things was to try to, because um, public works, again, with different objectives can come from different angles. And I think the synergies with existing national programs on social protection or on youth or um, social development, uh, you know, it's important, I think, to have those kinds of questions so that people are aware that there's some linkages that could be made. Seven, the contributions to skills on employability. And then the last one, which is about safeguarding of conditions of work and labor practices. Okay, so next. So let me just go just a little bit more in detail um, of the actual tools. Um, if, we go, if we look at the eligibility and targeting, um, Basically, we're addressing questions um, which are related to the target population. Um, what kind of households? Are they food insecure? What level of poverty? Um, we're talking about the different types of eligibility criteria. So targeting criteria, targeting methodologies, the measures for inclusiveness um, were sort of the key, I would say, um, types of questions. Next. So in this slide, and it, I know it's very difficult to see, but you can you can download this on your computers from the ESPA site. Um, you you have the Excel files, and basically the questions were put up in such a in a very systematic but simple way, so that whoever's doing the data collection, because I think that's one of the maybe more burdensome or heavy. Um, work that needs to be carried out is getting the data for this. But so we tried to highlight sort of the main, I would say, key issues that really need to be um, considered in, uh, in the issues around targeting. Um, OK, so I'll leave that at that. Next. So the next one that I'd like to highlight is um, about the benefits, timing, and the duration of programs. And here we're talking about addressing questions, um, again, which are related to public works um, and whether they provide the proper entitlements, um, which are adequate, um, appropriate, compatible with the local context. Um, so it's really about the comprehensiveness of the program benefits, the adequacy and the appropriateness of cash wage rates, the adequacy and appropriateness of food transfers, the impact on, and, and of course, the impact on the, on the local economy. And all of this is very much contextualized to the country level. I should maybe just also add that when carrying out these assessments, the tool itself can be modified or to be contextualized to the needs of the country. So that there's a whole process at the very beginning, and I think a lot of this will be discussed in the next webinar, um, which is you know trying to prepare for the process of the data collection and the and the policy dialogue and so forth to gather this data. So the next slide is again, you know, the Excel sheet, and it, it gives you some of the questions. Um, that you'll see about the types of wages that were provided. Was it in kind? Um, you know, what was the benefit level? Um, and in the case of, you know, food, it would be what is the kilocalories per day um, and the energy intake, for example. Next. So the next criteria, um, which is considered criteria C, um, I would say is the one that's the most um, complete. I mean, complete in the sense that it, there's quite a lot of questionnaires linked to this, and I'll explain why. So this covers asset create. Uh, sorry, yeah, next. Uh, now, so that's fine. So asset creation and services. We're talking about questions which are related again to public works, um, looking at whether the the types of activities that we're providing respond to community needs, um, whether these protocols are efficient for their implementation and the quality assurance. Um, so it's about the rationale for projects supported by the program. It's about quality and management. It's about the environmental impact that these programs may have. It's about the cost benefits um, and preliminary and follow-up training and technical supervision at the work sites. There's additional open-ended questions at the end of the questionnaire that also allows um, data collectors to be able to get qualitative data, which can be also very useful in the assessment itself. Next. 
But why I say it's quite complete is that the asset creation, which is um, uh, criteria C, is then broken into five subsheets, um, which highlight five different types of activities. And the five different types of activities um, where, I mean, there may be more, but at the time when we were um, designing this with the develop with the other development partners, we came up with sort of five key ones, which were agriculture and natural resource management. Another one on road infrastructure construction and maintenance. So more the infrastructure side. Um, a third one on waste and sanitation. A fourth one on social services. So this is more the types of services that can be provided, early childhood, um, health services so forth. And then the last one, which is more about social infrastructure. So it's social infrastructure like schools and health centers um, that provide a basic service. Next. And so again, the next slide um, basically just shows you um, some of the questionnaires. And basically, each of the worksheets are, are asking questions, um, trying to get insight on the rationale for the projects that are supported by the program and the cost of the implementation of each of those activities. Next. Okay, so the next criteria is about institutions coordination and financing. Next. So here basically we're addressing questions, um, which are again about public works, um, related to the effective coordination between different national institutions and um, clear designation and roles and responsibilities within the institutions or coordination, but also on the financing. Um, here we're talking about the roles and responsibilities of diverse stakeholders and actors. We're talking about coordination and oversight mechanisms the importance of community participation and their involvement, not just in being um, implementers, but really from the time of the design of the program, um, highlighting their priorities all the way through um, evaluations and even sometimes using mechanisms like community contracting. Um, also about capacity building and flexibility to be able to scale up the program. And of course, financing, which is always a very important um, issue and how this is effectively managed. So next is the Excel file. So I can, yeah, I, I won't read um, the questions, but they're all there for you if you want to go back to them. Okay, so monitoring and evaluation next is about public works and their accountability. Um, as we all know, intentional or not intentional, sometimes there are leakages um, in the way, in the procedures, or in the documentation or administration of some of these programs. So we try to bring that to the forefront to be able to discuss um, their ability to track the results, um, but also not only assess the program impact, but also to look at the issues around transparency to be able to reduce the error, fraud, and corruption um, that could happen in some of these programs. So it's really about looking at the MIS or the MES systems, looking at the data collection, and then what are the measures that they have used to promote transparency, reduce error, um, fraud, corruption, maybe a way for, to have com a complaint mechanism and so forth. Um, and then the next slide again is the um, overview of the Excel file. Maybe I should also mention, as I said, it's very simple. So you see that there's only like five columns. Um, the question, and then it's yes, no, and if you want to add additional comments. So it's very, it's very um, simple to fill out, I think. I, would, I, I shouldn't say that. I should let the team from the webinar on the 21st um, tell you of their experience. But the questions were meant to be um, in a simple way so that, you know, the, the actual people that were filling it out could actually add more um, information in the open question. Um, but to try not to limit people in um, what we were trying to um, assess. Okay, so next. So the next is coherence and interaction across the different programs. Um, so I had mentioned, you know, that, that through public works, um, because they have different objectives, there's also a good opportunity, and I think it should be looked at positively, as to how we can then link and create synergies with other um, existing programs. So it's very important that when we're designing these programs, um, that we look at how, how they can be clear. So we, what, which objective are we trying to meet first? Um, if there's more than one objective, why? 
Um, how can we make these programs more coherent, integrated um, with the shared objectives and similar programs? Um, and that means like with other programs. So as I was saying, you know, the, the linkages, for example, between public works and other interventions, um, it could be social protection, it could be an environmental program, um, it could be a youth program, but there's definitely synergies that could be made um, in, in ensuring this. And I think one link um, that is worth highlighting here is that some programs that we have been, um, at least ILO has been backstopping, has, um, has offered the potential to look at a social protection program and a national infrastructure investment program. And for example, in the social protection based public works, um, we have supported with um, technical training on barefoot technicians. So to try to increase the level of uh, the quality of the assets. Um, and then on the other side, in some of these national large rural roads infrastructure programs, it has also been possible to target um, or to try to, to emphasize the importance of targeting um, community um, workers where possible. So I think there's, there's different ways in which these programs can interact and they can actually learn from the benefits of um, each other. I apologize. Um, okay, so then uh, what else? Yeah, and then it also um, to look at issues about um, you know, how, how is it, how does it offer access to people who have been, ex uh, how do we offer access to people who are excluded from public works? So this means um, in terms of, uh, if we look at the life cycle, we're talking about public works for the active working age. Um, so how are we then ensuring, ensuring that the elderly or say youth are being provided with um, an appropriate social protection or some sort of um, mechanism that allows for um, that continuity within the life cycle. And at the same time, of course, many of these programs should be looking at um, some sort of exit strategy so that they, the programs are not just short term, but that they're actually sustainable in such a way that maybe you're linking into the national capacity building program or training institution, which is then going to allow um, some of these uh, informal workers to actually transition to formality. Next. So again, um, the questionnaire. Okay, and I will then just move on to the next one, please is on skills and employability. Um, so as I was just saying earlier, the, the, the questions here are really about trying to um, assess the ability to build the local capacity of workers, not just the workers, but also the national, local and national institutions. So it's really about looking at the nature and content of the curricula. Um, and that's quite important because um, in one of the programs that we were supporting, um, although we, you know, we built this, um, supported the, the program to, to provide or to build the, these barefoot technicians at the same time, um, if they're not certified, if there's no national scheme to do the certification, if there's no not proper national curricula to, con to continue further learning, um, this becomes an issue. So that linkage between public works and skills and their employability is very important. And then what are some of the delivery mechanisms, incentives, and then the logistics that go around this. Um, so skills and employability is something that, um, was also highlighted as one of the areas, um, one of the criteria to be looked at. Um, next is the Excel file. And then I will go to the next criteria, which is about conditions of work and labor practices. So here we're talking about questions which are related again to public works, but to, to ensure that the, so it's a human investment. I mean, we're talking about ensuring appropriate conditions of work. Um, by applying fair labor standards and respecting um, or providing respect uh, for workers' rights, but also in terms of um, dignity of work. Um, so we're talking about compliance with national laws. So, you know, there's national labor laws um, and standards in relation also to maybe social protection benefits. There's also the issues around occupational safety and health when we're talking about public works. And we're also talking about um, respecting um, workers' rights. Um, so it's about national laws, regulations, application of labor standards, and then a couple of additional open-ended questions, which you'll see in the next slide, um, which again is the is the overall slide. Um, okay, so next and next. Okay, so um, how does the, how does this work? So I've just given you the 
details of the actual tool and the kind of just to give you a sense of what's inside the tools and the data collection part, but how actually to do these tools work. Um, basically, at the beginning, there is a request for the assessment um, and there's a whole preparatory phase and that request, as I mentioned earlier, could come from the government, could come from the development partner. It may just be that the government wishes to use these tools themselves. Um, but I think one of the advantages of having um, different partners involved is that, um, and especially at the local level, is that one, you're, you're increasing the policy dialogue um, at the national level, but you're also getting inputs and expertise um, from the different agencies. Um, at the same time, I would say cross check by the global working group who has been working on these issues. So usually at the beginning, there's, there, there would be an inception meeting um, which would include a stakeholder analysis and coordination of the different development partners, and that can take, you know, one to a few weeks, depending on um, on how how fluid the, the conversation is already happening at the at the country level. And basically, start, um, you it you the group has to start with creating an assessment team and hearing committee. Um, and there is an as I mentioned earlier, which actually walks. The team through the process, um, and there is an implementation or an inception report that is usually published. Um, and there is a process of training um, of the tool application and adaptation of the tool to the country context that takes place at the country, um, along with the national partners, of course. Then the red um, box, which is the launching of the assessment, um, there's an orientation meeting that will usually take place to agree on the objectives and the whole process and which agency is doing what, um, who's financing what. And oftentimes, um, I mean, although there is an initial cost to this, the cost can go anywhere from some 25000 up, um, depending, of course, on how far into the field you're going, how many field sites we're assessing, um, you know, the, the drivers, the cars, all the logistics. And so a lot of that is then being done at that time just prior to the launching of the assessment. Um, and a lot of that would then be concluded at this orientation meeting. Then the fourth box, which is about data collection. Um, this data collection can happen before the field assessment takes place. It can also happen before, say, um, different agencies that are joining the field assessment have arrived. Oftentimes this is done by the national consultant um, in support um, of the international one. Looking at desk reviews, pre-populating the questionnaires, um, having stakeholder consultations, site visits, and uh, having focus group discussions. Then the fifth box, uh, the assessment is about to, field assessment is about to take place. I believe um, field assessments have run anywhere from one to two weeks depending on the number of sites that um, the team is visiting. And the then there's, there's, I would say, the validation or the completion of the assessment matrix. Um, and then there's a process where there is drafting of the country report. The, 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 I would say the beneficial thing about the drafting of this country report is that it goes through a huge stakeholder, um, uh, or it's not stakeholder, stakeholder peer reviewing process reviewed, of course, by the national counterparts first and then the different local partners and then it is also shared at the international level um, so that the reports are assessed at the global level and what comes out of it is a nice country report um, that hopefully is then useful to assess where the strengths and the gaps are with the intention to basically fill that gap to how can we, um, provide um, support to sure that you know those gaps will disappear and that they have a much more complete program and that it can be scaled up. So in the final process there's a consultative workshop again with the government counterpart to ensure that they are in full agreement of the report um, and then there is a revision of the matrix of the report and then the final delivery to the stakeholders. So I hope that was clear. It's unfortunate that I, I, I can't interact with um, many of you um, but I think that's um, basically the overview of how the process works. Um, there, is there a next slide? I think there is one more, no? Yeah. So how does this work? I mean, I think the, the I guess I, this is, um, in conclusion, I guess I would like to just um, highlight these points, which I think are important. So how or why, I would say, it's country ownership. So there's national ownership of, um, of the whole process, of the whole um, work. I think as technical agencies, um, you know, what we would like to do is support this process. Um, 
tailoring the tool to the country context, um, the harmonization of indicators, the language, the understanding of the multiple objectives, the trade-offs in public works is very important. Um, important to identify the right entry points and the lead agencies. Um, having a broad stakeholder participation across the different sectors, administrative, non-governmental, public, private, um, strengthening the interagency cooperation. Um, the other point, which I already mentioned, but the training of the assessment team and the stakeholders, uh, a need for careful planning, committing the necessary time and the resources. Um, a certain degree of flexibility is always helpful. And then, of course, the periodic application of the tool um, should be assessed every three to five years. Um, I didn't mention this, but the tool, again, was developed by multiple partners, um, maybe some two or three years ago. Um, and the tool is a live tool. So the intention is that we keep updating it um, to try to ensure that, um, you know, that the tool is the most uh, user friendly for, for, the, for those governments that are planning to use it. Um, but the advantage of the tool then is, you know, the, the national ownership, the fact that it, it actually contributes to stronger collaboration, we think, between the different agencies and the stakeholders. Um, and it also allows agencies um, to have common language or common interventions, coherent interventions. Um, the, the tool is flexible and adaptable. So it's a it's a great way to be to use um, it contextualized to your context, and uh, with the help of the World Bank and um, the ILO, the the tools as I mentioned earlier have been translated into different languages, um, and it basically enhances collaboration. Um, I mean, not just within the local level, but as also within the local level and the global actors. Um, it creates and adopts a systemic perspective on social protection. It's participatory, it's multi-stakeholder and cross-sectoral um, in terms of implementation process. So those are my um, multiple points that I would just say as a selling point of the tool. Um, I, I think that it has the, the advantage to do quite a lot if, um, you know, it, um, if used correctly and that there's still a lot of opportunity for um, continuing to, to modify or better the tool. So I think with that, I'll stop in case there are any questions. Um, so I turn over to Luz. Yes, Mito, thank you so much for a very thorough presentation. And uh, I think that it, we have a number of questions. And we, I want to let you know that we have an audience of around 20 people who have been very, very disciplined and very uh, engaged in, in your talk. So the first question is you mentioned the different sorry the different you mentioned the different types of assets and services that can be developed with public works can you elaborate a little bit more on that you want me to take them one by one Luz? Yes, I mean, if if it's something that you think okay. that. Sure. No, so um, in regards to the different assets, um, asset creation and services um, that can be provided, um, there's, as I mentioned, there were the five that we highlighted were agriculture, natural resource management, road infrastructure, construction and maintenance. Three was waste sanitation management. Four was social services. Five was social infrastructure. The reason we picked or we, I would say we kind of concluded on those five was basically with the idea that public works, if we're looking at it from the perspective of social protection, of providing income security um, to, the, to as many people as possible through public works, then these are five areas where you can have employment intensive or labor-based type of programs um, uh, that can be designed in such a way that they can ensure predictable income. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that, yeah, I mean, it explains the different types. So we have a second question here. You mentioned the different potential applications of the public works tool. Could this tool be applied for any type of public work program? Yeah, so um, interestingly, it, it's a debate that we had also within the working group um, when the tool was being developed because um, yes, the tool can. It has been actually used for that in Senegal, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, in Senegal, the it had, I think it, they had assessed some 10 plus different types of public works program, not just social protection ones, but also national investment, road infrastructure type of programs. 
Um, so it, it is, it is, it can be used to do that. I would argue that the tool could also be enhanced to include more, I would say, questions that might help um, from a from an investment perspective. But in general, yes, it could, and it has actually in Senegal. The the so many. Um, public works programs that were assessed and then they brought it down to I think it was five or six to do a further assessment. Um, um, so yeah, no, it definitely can. And it can also be used for the design of some of these programs. But again, um, I guess with the, just to mention that, you know, it could be enhanced further. Very good. Uh, another question. Can you say a little bit more about the country context in which the public works program tool can ideally be applied? Is there any like ideal country to apply the uh, ideal context to apply the tool? No, so or it can be applied everywhere. Well, it depends on how you're applying it because the design, of course, can be applied anywhere. I mean, you're you're basically taking a tool that has been, you know, discussed and debated by different agencies who have different mandates. Um, so, as I said, some of that, you know, has been done already. So, in a way, the tool serves as a best practices in a way of, um, of I would say, some of the criteria that, that different agencies felt that were probably the most important. So, from a design perspective, yes, it can be used in different country contexts, whether it's fragility or whether we're talking about short-term programs, because I think it gives that approach which includes the long-term vision or to try to create more sustainability through these programs. Um, but at the same time, if we're talking about doing a proper field assessment, um, obviously the field assessment um, you know, will very much depend on the country context because if you don't have institutions because of a situation of conflict, it's very difficult to do the assessment if the if you don't have a counterpart to be doing the data collection with. So I think you, you have to be practical and try to see how best the tool can serve your purpose. Um, but it can be, I think, used in different uh, in different in in different applications of the tool. Excellent. Are all the assessment criteria equally important, or would you say they can be ranked by importance? They, they, I, I, they were not put in any sort of, um, you know, we started with the targeting, but that, that, you know, they're, they're all equally important. So it's not that one overrides the other. Um, each of those worksheets that I kind of went through um, were debated for quite a bit of time to highlight their importance, but they're all equally important. We have another question. Tool was already applied in five, in four countries. What is the plan of the interagency initiative to proactively promote the tool to benefit more countries? Should I turn that one over to you, Luz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we, we will continue doing webinars and uh, in the in our help desk. Uh, we are always um, ready to to channel your questions. Uh, as Mito mentioned, they have uh, what they call the working group, the public works working group. So whenever uh, a country or um, uh, an agency is interested in interested in apply the, the tools, they contact us and we put them in touch with the working group or with other experts who have been involved in the application of this tool. Uh, so uh, regarding training, we will continue doing webinars. And also, we are planning to do a face-to-face -face learning event early next year, possibly in the, in East Asia, and mainly targeted to East Asia and South Asia regions. Um, but this is an ISPA event. It's not only about public works. It's a, like a larger event. Um, but we will provide more information um, lately during the year. But of course, like the, the help desk is always um, available and the door is open for your questions or for uh, i mean for your request of, of support there is a another question here how is can finance add, yeah Luz, can i just add to that um maybe sure. just do a quick sure. plug because we we also um i mean i think every agency um promotes the tools in in their capacity um whether it's at the local level or at the global level i just wanted to highlight because this is about public works there is a regional seminar for labor-based practitioners coming up uh, in November 13 through 17. It usually brings, attracts some 300 public works experts. 
Um, and, and we do highlight these things and these kinds of events um, when we have a chance. It was also highlighted at COP22 last year um, and how some of the, you know, that there are these tools that are actually bringing agencies together to collaborate together. So I think it's it's also up to each agency and, and I think we have been doing that um, to try to promote the use of the tool. Um, but just to also highlight for anybody interested in the regional seminar, um, please drop me a line and we'd be happy to see how we can get you to join us. Correct. Another question is, how is financing obtained for the tool in a country context? The World Bank or the agencies involved? <laughs> Those are um, tricky questions. Yeah, I, I think that, that the, the financing, as I had mentioned, um, and Luz can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in most cases, not just for the public works, but in general, um, you know, financing for a very basic assessment has gone anywhere from 25,000 upwards. Um, and sometimes that has been financed by donors. Um, other times it has been financed by governments. Um, and I think that the whole point of this is that as, you know, as we've mentioned throughout the presentation, we're working with multiple development partners and agencies and each agency has something to contribute. So, so far, I would say we've, we've managed to, to mobilize, um, money either between different agencies or um, hopefully, you know, you can go to your World Bank counterpart also. I mean, I think there's different ways of, of, of jointly funding this and everyone at the local level has a different um, way of contributing. And I think that's that's the whole beauty of the tool is that it's a tool that was de designed and developed by through consensus um, and sometimes painful consensus, but mm -hmm. through consensus to come to a to a tool that is you know, functional, and I think then it's up to us to, you know, ensure that the efforts that we put into it, um, uh, you know, come out to, to to something very positive. And I think so far, at least what we've noticed is that it has, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, some of the benefits is the national ownership, the fact that um, we have had better dialogue, policy dialogue, I think not just with stakeholders, but, you know, mainly with agencies, because we come with different mandates and objectives. And so for various reasons, um, I think the tool um, it can be very beneficial and the financing should, you know, we should all put joint our forces together to see where we can um, find funds to do these assessments. But again, I mean, it, it's not, it, it doesn't have to be costly. I think that where the cost comes in is usually um, in terms of field assessment. So it depends on how remote the terrain is or which air, rural area, you, you know, one is going to, how many sites, um, these kind of things. And I think that's pretty much up to the national counterpart to assess um, what they think would make more sense. Okay, so the next question may be relevant to what you're saying right now. Can a country apply the tool without the support of international agencies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the tool is available online, um, so you can use it, you know, as a, in a way to create a baseline and then continue developing on that. I think the advantage of of calling on support of one of the agencies who should then call us the support of the working group is that um, not only, um, you know, would, would the country benefit from maybe different perspectives and maybe even possibly mobilizing resources for it, but more importantly also I think we as technical agencies um, are also learning from each of these processes. So, you know, the joint collaboration um, you know, you can do it alone. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of benefits of doing it together. Correct. Okay. Um, we don't have more questions in uh, here in the system. There's a there's a question for our colleagues on uh, socialprotection.org. I don't know if this is possible or not. Is is it possible to open the the floor for question like uh, live questions from the uh, from the audience like voice questions mm -hmm. i see we have a around 33 attendees and probably some of them want either to provide questions or to a comment on the tool. Hello? Okay. We could also ask Luz if there's any countries that see the potential for using these tools. 
I mean, do you see a potential for for the application of this tool, whether it's you know the country itself or with the support? Um, but can you see benefits in using this tool in the countries that you're you're coming from? Or would if or if you're coming from a development partner or or a UN agency or technical agency, you know if your agency is not already participating, would your agency see benefits in um, not just participating but actively contributing to bettering the tool? So I hope that entices. Okay. Right so maybe while while we wait for for uh, more reactions from the audience, we have another question. Has the tool been tested or evaluated in countries with large WFP cash and full for asset programs? Um, so far, no. Uh, the the four I don't I'll, I'll repeat the countries in case um, some some of you may have come in afterward, um, but the four countries where we actually carried out the public works assessment were El Salvador, Liberia, um, Senegal, and Tanzania. The first three were led by the uh, the World Bank with different agencies and including WFP's participation. The last one. Um, was ILO in the lead. But all of those programs, I would say, maybe in the Senegal one, there might have been one of the public works programs. So I think they had assessed one from the one program financed by the EU, one program financed by the WFP. But there hasn't, as far as I know, there hasn't been sort of a, 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 a large um, WFP um, type of food for work or cash for work type of program assessed. There was some discussion um, about a year ago or two years ago about the interest of um, Ethiopia's PSNP. Um, you know, so there's been there's been informal discussions of interest and 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 uh, but WFP, not that I'm aware of. But we would welcome to do a WFP assessment. We there was a discussion some time back of possibly carrying out a WFP assessment in Asia, um, but in the end that didn't. Um, didn't materialize. So we would welcome WFP to take the lead and we'd be happy to support technically. Yes, and I just want to remind the audience that um, WFP was an active contributor in the development of the tool. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I was mentioning at the beginning that, you know, a lot of their food rationing and energy requirements, um, I thought was a very useful contribution from WFP. So, you know, each agency had their contribution, which is, I think, you'll find reflected in the tool when you go through the tool. Yes. Uh, our colleagues from socialprotection.org uh, said that they can try to open the microphones, uh, but we have to be mindful of the, of the microphones that the audience may have, so the, the quality the quality of the sound may not be um, very good. So, but let's let's try. Let's try to see if there are questions or comments from the audience. I, we see some of our colleagues who participated in the development of the tool are connected. If you guys want to add something, comment, this is the moment to do it. Okay, we'll see people very shy today. So, Mito, I, uh, I think that if we don't have further questions, uh, just invite the, uh, the, uh, the audience for the next webinar next week. You want to comment something on that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I I think what um, this is a two-part series, or it's a, it's a this is the first part of a two-part series of a webinar, and um, I think you'll find it interesting, especially if you have been participating in this webinar, um, which is more about the general introduction, to actually participate in the webinar, which will be held on the 21st of September, um, which will focus on the examples and the experiences from Tanzania. So we will have. Um, very fortunately, we will have uh, somebody from TASAF, from the Social Fund um, in Tanzania that will join us, along with our working group colleagues um, from Finland um, and also from our ILO office in DAR, um, who are very much um, 
involved and thanks to them, the assessment was um, able to be carried out. Um, and I think there you will get more insight and more useful insight um, or tips on how the process actually went and what it um, worked, what didn't, um, and, uh, and what the outcomes were. So I hope with that, I mean, I hope I'm enticing you to join us. And there is, I should mention, if um, if Luce allows me to, that there is a third webinar on the 23rd of November, I believe, um, which will be in French. And there it will be our colleagues from OECD who had also um, participated in the Tanzania assessment. Um, and the idea there is to do something similar, but in French for those um, colleagues who are uh, strong, you know, would prefer to listen in French. Yes, um, my friends from uh, socialprotection.org just uh, guided me here. If you, if the audience wants want to raise their hands and comment, we are gonna give you an opportunity to do it. You have to raise your hands, and we'll activate the system. Okay, so um, I think that uh, they are preparing their comments and questions for the next webinar next week. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mito. Thank you, uh, our colleagues from socialprotection.org, our 37 participants who have been uh, very engaged in this conversation. If you have questions or comments, please send us an email to info at ispatools.org. And we will be happy to respond to your questions or, or your comments or and to guide you on also um, all the people that can provide you with, with additional information. Uh, thank you again and uh, hope to have your participation in next week's uh, webinar with the application of this tool, the Public Works tool in Tanzania. Thank you so much and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.